Thank you for joining us at this hour. I'm Daniel Chen with this hour's latest. Now, after a day of skirmishes over a planned launch of anti-North Korea leaflets across the border, conservative activists in South Korea let their propaganda leaflets take flight anyway. Attention now shifts to whether Pyongyang, which had repeatedly warned of grave consequences for such actions, will stand by an inter-Korean deal for talks. Our Choi Yoo-sun starts us off. Despite strong resistance from progressive civic groups in Seoul and South Korean businesses at the inter-Korean Kezang Industrial Complex, conservative activists in South Korea sent some 20,000 anti-North Korea leaflets across the border late Saturday. We have decided to openly send the leaflets to show the public that brutality and violence cannot stop the dissemination of truth. While Pyongyang hasn't yet reacted to the latest leaflet launch, it had warned of military action and significant damage to inter-Korean ties should the South Korean government fail to stop the activists. Acknowledging the leaflets do nothing to improve inter-Korean relations, Seoul on Sunday reiterated its position that there are no legal grounds for stopping the launches out of respect for the constitutional value of freedom of expression. A unification ministry official, however, added that the authorities have and will intervene if necessary to ensure the safety of South Koreans either because of North Korean threats or an internal clash resulting from the leaflet launch. Experts here in the South predict the North could either carry out a provocation or walk away from a scheduled round of inter-Korean talks demanding Seoul come up with a way to prevent further launches. Seoul had proposed October 30th for the talks. Others say that even if the high-level talks occur, the leaflet issue will likely become a bone of contention between the two sides. Choi Yoo-sun, Arirang News. It looks like Seoul and Washington will maintain a joint decision-making process in their revised Civilian Nuclear Energy Cooperation Pact. Citing diplomatic sources, South Korea's Yonhap News Agency reports the two sides are negotiating the thorny reprocessing and enrichment issues for the revised agreement which should replace the current one in March, by March, rather, 2016. Seoul wants more autonomy on the matter, while Washington is reluctant to allow it, in line with its non-proliferation policies. In that regard, the two sides are reportedly considering easing some restrictions on Seoul's decision to reprocess fuel for research and development. The foreign and defense ministers of the two countries noted significant progress was made on the negotiations at the recent 2 plus 2 meeting in Washington. President Bakune will meet with the leaders of the ruling and opposition parties after giving a policy speech on the budget at the National Assembly on Wednesday. The presidential office of Changwa De says the meeting will include the leaders, floor leaders and policy committee chiefs of both parties. In the meeting, President Bak is expected to seek support for a prompt passage of her government's economic revitalization bills, as well as next year's budget bill. This will be her second meeting with both party leaders since September of last year, and with the floor leaders since July. Korea's parliamentary speaker, Chung Woo-ha, is in Japan for talks with top Japanese politicians, including Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The topics up for discussions during his three-day visit include ways to resolve various historical issues stemming from Japan's colonial rule of the Korean Peninsula, as well as how to advance the two countries' bilateral ties. The visit comes at the invitation of Unmei Ibuki, the Speaker of Japan's lower house of parliament. In addition to Ibuki, Chung is ex expect scheduled rather to meet with Masaki Yamazaki, the President of the upper house of parliament, and Abe on Monday. Korea is on top of the world in certain economic sectors, but is falling behind on others, according to a new report. And as our Kwon so tells us, the gap between the two could be a stumbling block for the country in the future. Korea is performing well in manufacturing and trade, but is still a step behind in quality of life and labor conditions, which could eventually hold the country and its economy back. 
The Korea International Trade Association's annual report, based on data from around 170 sources in various economic categories, was released on Sunday and shows the country's biggest strengths and weaknesses. The manufacturing sector continues to do well, as Korea shipped the largest number of mobile phones in the world in 2013, and its semiconductor sales and ship orders were the second highest in the world. Automobile and steel production landed in fifth and sixth place. On the trade front, Korea was the seventh largest exporter last year, had the ninth biggest overall trade volume and the 13th largest trade surplus. Korea also ranked seventh on this year's Fortune 500 list, with 17 Korean companies on the list. Among the 17 was Samsung Electronics, the world's number one smartphone maker, which saw its brand value go up a notch from last year to eighth place, and Hyundai Motor Group, the world's fifth largest automobile maker, which went up 10 spots to 43rd. Asia's fourth largest economy is also a powerhouse in the R&D and financial fields. However, the social and labor sectors are still far below par for a developed nation. Korea ranked in 41st place for quality of life, down from 34th last year, and Koreans worked the second most hours per year of any country on the list. Korea's female labor participation rate stands at just 50 percent, and the nation's birth rate is among the lowest in the world, ranking 168th out of 171 countries. The Trade Association attributed Korea's uneven economic development to its rapid economic growth, adding the gap between certain sectors needs to be narrowed to achieve more stable growth. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And Hyundai Kia Motor Group's global market share reached 9 percent in the third quarter. According to Auto Industry Data Sunday, Hyundai and Kia sold a combined near 1.9 million cars in the third quarter. That's an increase of 2.7 percent from the same period last year. Although it's a 0.1 percent drop from the 9.1 percent recorded in the second quarter, industry watchers say staying in the 9 percent range is an achievement, considering the strong Korean currency and recent labor union strikes that halted production on several locations. Hyundai Motor Group, the country's biggest automaker, said extended operations abroad could make up for the domestic production problems. Seventy cloud computing companies from Korea and around the world are gathering in Busan for Cloud Expo Korea 2014. The three-day exhibition begins on Monday in the southern port city. The companies will put their newest technologies and products on display, and they will have the opportunity to share cloud-based technology trends at a series of meetings. The Ministry of Science, ICT and Future Planning, the event host, hopes the expo offers visitors more information about cloud computing, let STEM experience related services and increase awareness of technologies that can contribute to the growth of related businesses. The Cloud Expo is one of the events being held on the sidelines of the ITU Plenipotentiary Conference in its second week. Hong Kong's chief executive says he is not stepping down despite calls for his resignation by pro-democracy advocates as well as his biggest critic in the political realm. In an interview with cable TV Hong Kong, Xi Wai Liung said it is necessary to go back to the existing legal framework to resolve the current crisis instead of using illegal means. This comes after James Tian Pei Chun, the head of the Liberal Party, which supports Beijing, called on Liung to step down, saying the people have lost trust in the government. The chief executive's longtime critic added that there is nothing else Liung can do to improve the situation in the country. Meanwhile, protest leaders who were planning a vote on their next steps following disappointing talks with the government were forced to suspend the plan due to differences of opinion on the format. Over in Australia, a teenager suspected of contracting Ebola is in isolation and being tested for the deadly virus. The 18-year-old arrived from Guinea and had moved to Brisbane with her extended family 11 days ago. She was placed in an isolation room in the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital after developing a fever. None of her eight family members are showing signs of illness. The first test results are expected in the early hours of Monday morning and the second set in three days. Queensland's chief health officer says it is unlikely the young woman has Ebola, as she could not remember coming into contact with someone suffering from the disease. However, she has been in an area with a significant number of Ebola cases, so the possibility cannot be ruled out. 
A man in Bulgaria who was paralyzed from the chest down is now able to walk again following a cell transplant surgery. But while some doctors have described it as a breakthrough that could open a new chapter for disabled people, others say it is too soon to pop the bubblies. Our Kim Minji has more. Direct Fidika, a 38-year-old man from Bulgaria, is able to walk again after the injuries from a knife attack that left him paralyzed four years ago. He was once unable to feel his legs, but now he can slowly move them with the help of leg braces, and he can even drive a car. Surgeons in Poland took nerve cells from his nose and transplanted them into his damaged spinal cord. The olfactory cells, specialist cells that constantly renew themselves, appear to have prompted the spinal nerves to regrow and regain their function. Before the landmark operation, Fidika had shown no signs of recovery despite months of physiotherapy. But now, just three months after the surgery, his left thigh muscle is starting to grow, enabling him to move his hips. The BBC, which broadcast a documentary about the procedure, described it as a breakthrough, saying that if further developed, it will result in a historic change for people with spinal cord injuries. However, others in the field are reluctant to be too optimistic about the procedure, saying that more research is still needed. Kim min Arirang News. And now the weather and a clear sign that autumn is fading. The mercury will be inching closer to zero in the coming weeks. On Monday in Seoul, the daytime low will be close to 7 degrees Celsius, later getting up to a high of 17. And now let's check out the weather conditions in your neck of the woods and around the world. And those are the stories we could squeeze into this hour. Thank you for watching. Have a great start to your new week.